So glad to have you here. Um, my name is Nora Super, and I'm with the Milken Institute. I'm the Director of Policy and Programs for the Center for the Future on Aging, and we're delighted to have you all here for this really great panel discussion on the next urban revolution, reimagining cities for an aging population. Um, we're uh, right on my right, of course, is um, Secretary Julian Castro, who now, he was the Secretary of, Health, of Housing and Urban Development under President Obama, where we had the opportunity to interact. And now he is in the LBJ School in Austin and is a fellow on international trade policy. Um, we also have Jim Anderson uh, on his right, who's the head of government innovation from Bloomberg Philanthropies. Then to my left, I have Tom Lanch, who's senior vice president and general manager of Internet of Things Group for Intel Corporation. And finally, last but not least, we have Yana Remis, who is a partner at the McKinsey Global Institute. So if many of you all are here, you probably know some about the phenomenon of our aging populations, but I thought I'd just uh, share a few facts to set the tone. By 2020, the global population of people over 60 will outnumber children under five for the first time. In Tokyo, Milan, and Barcelona, the <clears throat> over 65s outnumber the under 14s by a factor of around two to one. And here in Los Angeles, which is the nation's largest county by population, and also one of its most socioeconomically diverse, it's projected to become increasingly old as well. By 2020, the country's age, the county, excuse me, age 50 or older population is expected to increase by 27%, and the population age 65 or older by 43%. Mm -hmm. So these are issues that are really um, <clears throat> facing all of us as we move into the next part of this century. So I thought I'd kick it off since our title is Reimagining Cities and ask each of our speakers to talk about as they reimagine cities for an aging population, what does your vision look like? I'll start with you, Secretary Castro. Yeah, well, first, thanks so much uh, for having me here. It's great to be here. Um, so. I would say a couple of things. Um, number one, very quickly, that we've spent a lot of time over the last two decades so focused on young people. Uh, think about the rise of the creative class and all that's been written about how to make your city more attractive to young people, and not as much time focused on the fastest growing demographic in our country. So my vision uh, would include cities orienting their policy in at least two ways. <laughs> number one, connecting the dots better uh, among different policy issues when we think, for example, about housing and health, uh, housing and infrastructure. Um, uh, I once had uh, an adult woman come up to me after a city council budget meeting in a neighborhood and ask if we could put money on a street for sidewalks where her mother lived because her mom had just been diagnosed with diabetes, uh, her elderly mother but couldn't walk around the neighborhood to improve her circulation because there were no sidewalks. Mm -hmm. And as a young policymaker, it ingrained in my head the connection there, in that case between infrastructure and health. Um, and then secondly, we need to focus <coughs> on the way that people are living now and that they're gonna live in the future and not just how they lived in the past. In Cleveland, when I was HUD secretary, I saw uh, a housing development that the Cleveland Housing Authority did that was for grandparents raising their grandchildren. That flies in the face of how we usually did housing, which was either for basically working age parents raising their children or single, largely single, elderly people. And there are almost three million folks out there that are raising grandparents that are raising their grandchildren as their own children. Mm -hmm. So understanding how people are living now and how they're going to be living in the future. Great. Jim, what's your vision? Uh, it is awesome to be here with you guys today. So I, I come from the Bloomberg Foundation um, and, and focus on public sector innovation programs. And so we work with cities around the globe to help them innovate new solutions to pressing social and economic political challenges, to test those solutions, to scale up things that work, to discard things that don't, 
We do a tremendous amount with cities focused on data and evidence, data to define problems, evidence to create better solutions that have the potential for greater impact. And we also do a lot uh, with leadership um, development, mayors, chiefs of staff, chief innovation officers, data officers, and, and that work brings us now to about 250 cities around the world. And, you know, when I think about this issue, you know, and particularly in light of the statistics that Nora ran through, it's clearly an urgent issue. Uh, the consequences of this demographic shift over the next 10 to 20 years are profound and significant and will really impact our social systems, our welfare systems, our political economies, and so on and so forth. It is not yet a politically important issue in most municipalities. And, and I think one great sign of that is if you look at the, the, the state of the city speeches from mayors around the country, this is not an issue where mayors are beating their chests and saying, wow, we have to prepare for this incredible change that's fast on us. When um, we do mayoral surveys, um, and others do mayoral surveys, uh, we recently launched or announced, um, released a big survey of mayors, I think the largest of sitting mayors ever. We asked the question, probably in four ways, what keeps you up at night? What's the biggest issue in 10 years that no one's focused on? The aging issue is just not on the radar. That's okay. There are pressing other issues. Mayors are fighting fires day in and day out. But I think when, I, when we think a little bit about vision for the future, I think a lot of it is how do we start increasing the ambition of city leaders today to start articulating a different idea of what it means for seniors to be living longer, stronger, and more engaged in their communities. There's an incredible statistic coming out of Seoul, which is when you look at 50 to 65-year-olds in Seoul, South Korea, it is now likely that they will be with us for another 40 to 50 years. And so that's not an afterthought. That's not an encore career. That's 40 to 50 percent of life left. And so that demands that we we think in a very different, different way about the services. And, and I love the connection point. Um, but I think shifting the ambition level up and I think moving, building on the point that the secretary made, the vulnerability mindset is, is important and, and making sure the safety net is there, but an asset-based mindset is a very different way to approach this population and I think that's the future because I think the assets and the opportunities are just as great if not greater than the vulnerabilities that we're all so acutely aware of. Great. Tom? Yeah, my name is Tom Lanch um, from Intel. Uh, you know, as a business executive in the technology world, we're, we're always looking at ways to innovate, and uh, this is one of those areas that's pretty interesting to us, um, largely because uh, for all the all the statistics that we're given, the world is, is getting older. Maybe it's because I'm getting older now, I'm 58, so I'm <laughs> moving into that population band myself, but um, there there's Technology is far from the solution to this problem, but there are a lot of technological things that we can do. We know we, we are extending you know, uh, life by, by the, the approaches that we're taking in medicine. Uh, there's no doubt about it. So we're contributing every single day by the advances we're making technologically to, to contribute to this problem, if you would. Uh, but also we can, we, can, we can create more independence for people. I, I think for me, um, the city, of the future is one of um, community and and personal uh, ability to contribute uh, consistently. But probably the last one is about the ability to continue to be independent uh, and, and, and foster independence, um, which as we grow older is is more challenging. I mean, we, we become, could be our eyesight, could be lots of different things. I think your world can start closing in on you and, and technology I think can play a role in continuing to make things more accessible uh, and to continue to, to make the world a much more vibrant place. And so not closing doors, but actually opening up new ones. And so that's sort of the view I, I look at it. Great. Yana? Thanks, Nora. A real pleasure to be here. Well, on the vision of, of the cities of the future when with aging, I actually would love to see a collection of thriving cities that don't look in, in many ways very similar. The baby boomers, as they age, they're not only shifting the, the, the people balance to that age group, but they also bring it together with their, let's break the way things were done before. So we'll probably see cities adjust 
to the aging population in their city in very different ways. Mm -hmm. We'll have some of the more traditional retirement communities, but we'll have university towns, for example, have a community of elderly retirees who enjoy the culture and, and being around of young people, the walkability of many college towns. We might have uh, communities with multi-generational housing, I mean, a clear trend as we see the demographic shift to oftentimes more recent immigrant families who like to live in multi-generational housing. And then we'll have a lot of new niches coming up. My, one of my favorite examples is actually from Texas, from mm -hmm. Livingston. They have a, um, it's called Escapees Care Center, where people can drive in with their RV and get health care and other services which they need, and yet they don't need to leave their RV where they have like, enjoyed living. So I think for me, it really is about watching the change and for cities to be receptive to the kinds of uh, populations they have, innovating and experimenting. And I think it actually will be a very exciting space to watch. Mm. Terrific. Um, as many of you all uh, may know, the Milken Institute publishes a Best Cities for Successful Aging. And we just published the third edition last year. And the question of what makes a best city is a good one, I think, as we think about it. Um, Secretary Castro and I interacted when I was the executive director of the White House Conference on Aging under President Obama. And as one of the great things about the White House is you can bring people together from all sectors and really think about all these different impacts. And we really viewed housing and transportation as part of healthy aging, not just health care. And all of the things that we've talked about, you discussed uh, a walkable city for someone um, and and the, the great example in um, in Cleveland that you mentioned, uh, Yana, you talked about Texas as, as well. When we look at it, um, we think about living arrangements, community engagement, as I said, transportation, convenience, health care, wellness, employment, which is increasingly an issue for older adults if they want to stay working because that's good for their health, but many have to stay working because they simply don't have enough uh, resources to retire at 65. Uh, general livability, education, Yana mentioned uh, university towns as a thriving place for many older adults, and financial security. So I'm just wondering uh, if, if others of you have examples of what you've all traveled all over, uh, if there are places that you'd say, who's doing it right? Well, I can jump in if I may from my, I'm from <coughs> Finland, so I'm picking a Finnish town, Oulu, a northern part that most people wouldn't pick as the natural place for the innovation center, but it happened to be one of Nokia's hometowns because of the way the city was, the city, the city was doing things. I think they are applying the same kind of innovative, all hands in solution to aging. In a uh, Finnish society, the government has a lot of support for elderly. So there's a strong incentive for the city government to work with the hospitals, the uh, social services sector, mobility, et cetera, to create an environment that's, um, that allows the elderly to continue to thrive in that environment. And I think they have done very, very well coordinating the information, bringing in actually elderly folks to talk about what they want. They have. Uh, not only accessible information to both elderly and their fam families in one place, all your questions answered, to community centers and social services where people can actually not just get some support but socialize and get together. So I think Olu is the one that I just love to watch because mm. they are applying the same innovative local approach to aging as they have done to many other places. Others? No, I, was, I, I have an example from my old neck of the woods in San Antonio. <laughs> I was a mayor there for a few years. Um, y'all know how, uh, and some of y'all have probably been through it in your career, uh, a lot of chambers of commerce in cities will have uh, you know, a chamber program where folks that are usually under the age of 40 will go through, and um, it's a leadership program, basically. In San Antonio, uh, they have that every year, like they do everywhere. Well, in our city, and I, I'm sure that it exists in some others, but I haven't seen it too widely. They have one for folks who have retired that the chamber and their fellow organizations also sponsor to harness the wonderful talent and the immense energy and willingness to contribute that is still available and to help place folks who are in retirement onto boards and commissions around the city of nonprofits and public boards, whether it's for the parks, the library, similar boards, but it's really neat because 
think about how many folks are retired that still are super talented and they have time on their hands and they want to contribute. It's called the Master's Leadership Program. It's really neat. Hmm. Yeah. Great. Do you want to add something, Jeff? Yeah, maybe uh, I'll mention uh, two cities that we're watching and that we're excited about. I think one is Seoul, which I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, the mayor of Seoul um, is a social innovator. He comes out of the social innovation community and has a real commitment to sourcing solutions at the grassroots level and has really tried to bring to what was a very hierarchical command and control style of government a more bottom-up, citizen-centered approach. And in 2013 or 2014, understanding fully the sort of consequence of the demographic shifts in Seoul, I mean, there it's, it's an acute issue unlike anything I think that we've yet to imagine here in the States. You know, he realized that it needed to be, I love what she said at the end, the all-in, hands-on, sort of a mission-based approach. So kind of getting beyond a string of initiatives, which are all important, and thinking about it as a mission. What if we want to create a new narrative around what it means to be older in our city. How do we do that? And what does that mean? Really committed to sort of user-centered ethnographic research. I think that is the starting point. We don't know what it actually means to be a 50 to 65 year old who is looking at 40 years of life left. We actually need to understand that better from their perspective. And so a really deep commitment to ethnographic research, to bottom up sort of idea generation from 2014 to 2016, prototyped a wide range of solutions, tested them in the community, engaged in a very robust conversation and came out of it with a pretty bold set of initiatives called the 50 plus initiative, new backbone organization that is sort of steering this whole thing, the whole idea of sort of government as a platform, identifying challenges and opportunities, creating opportunities for business, civil society, academia, everyday citizens to contribute to the challenge. This is now resulting in, I think, 20 new 50 plus centers, nine new 50 plus campuses, which are all focused on, and I love this, narrative change at both the individual and the population level. So at the individual level, the personal narrative got me through to retirement. And now I have 30 or 40 years of life left. What is my narrative for moving forward? City government sees its job as helping people articulate a new forward-facing mission for themselves. I love that. <laughs> That's like not your normal everyday sort of city government trick, right? So, and then very sort of bespoke connecting to educational or volunteer activities, um, a real focus on um, taking all of the expertise, and I love your example from San Antonio. This is the population that built the Korean economy. There's so much knowledge there and pride there, and they want to tap into that and find ways for that to be continually productive for the next 10, 20, 30 years. And so just a wide range of sort of all-in strategies, a real mission focus, I think, and a commitment to that um, human-centered design, I think, is really important. We fund, and I'll mention one other, um, in Tel Aviv, we have an innovation team in Mayor Holdai's office. Tel Aviv is also dealing with a rapidly aging population. Just in, I think, between 2013 and 2015, the senior population increased by 12%, while the rest of the population increased by 4%. They have a statistic that says every day, the average um, length of life increases by six hours in Tel Aviv. So they, they, they are experiencing this as a really immediate issue, and they also have a very vibrant, active, um, older Jewish community that I think keeps the, the, the political pressure on City Hall. But they have also gone into it with a really humble approach of sort of let's understand who people are, what they want, how the wide range of existing services that we're already spending critical dollars on are or are not meeting existing needs. The segmentation they've done of, of this population, so I think the, it's all older people are not the same. So they have this incredible segmentation around, well, there's the 50 to 65-year-olds, the young old. Then they have the 65 to 80-year-olds, the, the old. And then the 80 to 95-year-olds, the old, old. And they've segmented by ability to sort of mo move across the city, mm -hmm. ability to remain stably housed and to age in place. And what all of that does when mapped against the ethnographic research, it just is, it's exploding 
their minds around what's possible. And it's creating a level of sort of creative innovation that gets so far beyond like the patchwork of services that we're running today to really think about like, wow, we need to really get to a totally different level in our, in our, in our way of thinking about public services. So both of those are newer initiatives and I think you know, we should all be watching them because I think we'll learn a lot regardless of whether they're successful. Great. Um, Tom, I know it, at Intel you head up the um, program of the Internet of Things and look at technology. Um, are there cities that are really using technology well to address some of the aging population growth? Um, probably the most advanced cities, actually. Uh, you mentioned Seoul. It's a great, great example. Um, highly, one, one thing I'll say about Seoul, I think free Wi-Fi for everybody that lives there. So uh, now all of a sudden you have a communications backbone that you can offer lots of services on. Um, so that connectivity issue is a, is a big deal. Um, You'll see Singapore being quite aggressive, um, probably the most aggressive on transportation needs right now. I think they are probably leading the world on autonomous uh, vehicle work uh, and, and its implications. And again, I think for the aging population, I, I think this is going to be it's going to be a big deal. I mean, back to this freedom issue. Personally, um, I just sort of went through this with my mother. I lost my mother a couple of years ago. I, I'm I'm convinced. Uh, she wasn't. Getting, she was. She was due for, for a driver's license renewal, uh, and she lived in a small town in northern Michigan, and that wasn't going to happen. And her life was probably going to shrink very quickly. And I think she just sort of opted out. So I think this notion of transportation. I think this draw to cities for 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 older people is going to be higher because the services are going to be so much more interesting. So again, we're seeing that as well. There was big article in the Financial Times this, just this last week about cities around the world and how people used to leave uh, when they retired, but they're not leaving any longer. They're, they're staying. And that's putting a lot of pressure on the young people, actually, because the price affordability of housing now, which was a natural draw for, for young people to innovate in these cities, is also getting a pressure point because they're, the price points in these large cities are coming under, under pressure. Uh, so I think um, Singapore. Um, I, the, the Chinese are pretty aggressive in, in use of technology. Um, I think we can't ignore what's going on. These city mayors in China are, uh, control significant resources and deploy services fairly fast. Their, their rate of change over there is, is significant, so I think they fail fast and try a lot. Um, so I, it's, it's unfortunately not as many in North America or the West, or Western Europe, I would say, um, not as advanced. Yana, I know that you've looked at, you know, Tom raised the point of how populations that are aging are different than um, other populations. And as you all keep saying, as you keep saying, I have 40 more years of life, you know, I'm, whoa, I better start thinking about this myself. And, um, you know, what, can you tell us what your research has found about how the populations have changed in terms of aging? Yeah, it is fascinating. When you actually, when you look at it for all the developed economies, of all the consumption growth, 60% in Western Europe and China is going to come from the 60 plus age group, almost mm. half in the US. Mm. So basically, this is a group that's going to change consumption in a, in a heavy way. And they are going to consume in a different way than our traditional view of how elderly and retirees consume. First of all, they are clearly, they are more educated, they are more tech savvy, they have grown up in a very different environment than the previous generation. Unfortunately, they also are much more unequal. The 60 plus uh, age group has always been more, more unequal than anyone else. Some people have more savings than others when, you're, when your kind of wage income starts to slow down. Unfortunately, we, ha we saw that decline until about the 1980s, but now inequality amongst the elderly is rising. And the reason is both because we moved away from, um, uh, from pensions that you, get, you had guaranteed income in the, in the end to what you had to save yourself and the baby boomers haven't on overall saved very much. And I think that's going to be a big challenge. We will have problems of managing wealth, transferring housing, uh, all of those kinds of things for those people who have assets. And we will probably have more elderly who are poor. And I think that's something that most cities will have to, will have to face. They're going to be more diverse. There's going to be more ethnic diversity amongst the elderly. Another change, it's happening more slowly than it is on the younger generations. But overall, this is a generation that 
will have the consumption power across most goods and services. Already, more than two-thirds of cars are sold to folks over, uh, over 50, 50 or 55, I can't remember exactly. <coughs> but on most products, they are a major, major factor. They will also change the labor markets because of the fact that they will stay in the workforce for longer. Most companies will have to accommodate them because of their talent. But also, some of them are going to be jumping into the gig economy as their se second job. Drivers in the car sharing business, elderly are a very large part of that. They also are the ones who have the assets for shared assets, etc. And I think we will also see elderly innovators. You suddenly have, you can take more risk, you have more assets. You actually don't really care because you might have had your house paid and your kids through college. You can actually innovate more. So I think it is a, an interesting change that we are going to see. And it's going to come from the economic sphere in many ways. And I love the examples when you talked about the time that people will have. When we looked at the free time available in the US, 93% of the free hours of leisure are going to come from the 60 plus age group. Mm -hmm. What are these educated folks going to do with their time? Are they going to volunteer and give back to the community? Are they going to work more? Are they going to go into local political uh, activities? Are they going to perhaps do something internationally over the internet. I think it will be, for example, one of, another one of my great examples if some um, uh, elderly care uh, homes across the US have worked with a, um, and this was actually studied by a Brazilian English school that matches elderly folks with English students in Brazil. And they talk and chat weekly and create a, an opportunity for social connections in a, in a different way. So I think it will be a, a fun way to watch and I think it will be very different than what our stereotypical retiree would look like. You know, that's such a great example because what you reminded me of, my mother-in-law lived in a small rural town in Arkansas and she and her, you know, I'll call them girlfriends, but they were all, you know, in their 80s, would call each other every morning and check in on each other and they played Scrabble over the phone, you know, and they would like to say what their letters were and what they had, which was just such a great way to interact. But I think while we see all that promise, there's also some concern that um, some populations will be left out, you know, if they don't have the income or the education. Um, the New York Times had a piece just uh, yesterday about something happening in Bull Heights here in LA, where they uh, created what they call a play street mm -hmm. for um, children to play, but also older adults to come and play backgammon or Scrabble or socialize with each other. As some of you probably know, isolation is really a huge risk factor for people as they grow older and uh, can really impact people's health. And I know this is something you've thought a lot about, Secretary Castro. You know, as we look at the diversity in our population and uh, in the U.S., but also abroad, you know, what are some cultural differences that you think we uh, should make sure that we bring into, um, we think about as we look at the future of the aging populations? Well, I think one of them was mentioned, uh, you know, multi-generational housing, for instance, being sensitive to the cultural norms of different populations. Also, I think of uh, immigrants communities where English is a second language uh, and the comfort that one feels being able to age in place, or at least in the community that they're familiar with, um, that that may particularly be important to the quality of life uh, of some of our immigrant communities. I also think about you know, how much particularly uh, African American wealth was decimated during the housing crisis. And when we start talking about people aging, you know, and you stop working, whether you have savings, any other wealth besides your home becomes more and more important. And so what are we doing to grapple with that going forward when we think about inequality increasing in that segment? Uh, so uh, there's certainly a lot of policy questions to be uh, addressed. Um, and I would agree that I think whether it's at the federal level right now or the state level or the local level, that's not a leadership priority. Mm -hmm. You really don't see folks addressing that as a leadership priority in general. So I'll just follow up to, on that because I was going to ask you, um, how do we engage policymakers on this issue so that they're not 
that they're thinking about the future of their cities and their um, districts where they live. Is it that more older people run for office or that they're more active That, uh, in that would help. Yeah. <laughs> that would I, help. I, number one, I think that would help. Secondly, um, yeah, I know that organizations like AARP have become more active at the local level and state level in the last few years, but, but really when you think about uh, AARP, for instance, I'll, I'll just take that, which is a great organization. I mean, we think about it and we think about it's, it's lobbying at the federal level, right? Mm -hmm. Less so at the state and the local level, even though that does happen to some extent. I think that, that the voices of that community um, need to be heard on these issues in a much more robust way. And also, of course, having policymakers that have that perspective that are sitting on the city council, uh, you know, sitting in the state legislature does help. But for whatever reason, these policymakers have not been as directed at the people, at the very people for whom they go for to vote, to get support for votes, mm -hmm. which is odd. Yeah. yeah. And Jim, I know you all do a mayor's challenge, but it's not just focused on aging, right? It's innovation, but have you seen more attention to aging? Or if not, why do you think that is? Well, uh, so in our current Mayor's Challenge, the Mayor's Challenge is an innovation competition for cities. We've run it several times. Uh, we're currently in the middle of our second time here in the States. We had 330 um, bold solutions come in from cities across the United States, and three of them had anything to do with seniors. So it's, um, it's not registering as a top of brain issue for, for most American city leaders, if that's a sign. Um, you know, just going back to, to what the secretary was saying, I mean, I think I, I was thinking about this and thinking that maybe there's some lessons that we can take from the journey American cities and, and America has been on around climate change. I mean, I think 20 years ago, um, you know, there were the Al Gores and, and, and a pretty gross divide between sort of the thought leaders on the climate change issue and the way that everyday Americans felt about it and the level of political prioritization that we were giving it, certainly at the federal level, but also at the local level. And over the past 20 years, really since 2005, American cities have pioneered the notion of the sustainability officer. Mayors sort of emerged as a, filling a leadership void and, and experienced a leadership benefit for taking these issues on. They found a way to plug into um, national and at times global media recognition for sort of acting out on these issues. This goes back to Greg Nichols and um, the early days back in Seattle. So, you know, maybe we need to think a little bit more about how we as folks who are interested in this issue and recognize the degree of change that's coming, uh, you know, the language issues matter, how we talk about it with citizens. How do you sort of shift this sort of, you know, lots of more old people over the next 20 yeah. years? You know, there's, there's an analogy with the way that we're now talking about climate change as a public health issue, as an air pollution issue in San Antonio or as an air pollution issue in Denver. It's immediate, I feel it, my kids go to school in it, and I care about it. And I'm gonna call my mayor about it. Hmm. You know, I wonder if there's something in the language of all of this that might help us reframe and create more urgency where today there, there, there isn't what we'd like. And, and then I think we need to think about political and sort of leadership opportunities for the folks. You know, we, need some, we need some early adapter U.S. mayors to sort of you know, say, hey, I'm going to make this a distinguishing trait of my leadership, and I'm going to get that attention. They all crave that. Yeah. We know yeah, that. I, I very much agree with that. You need to find two or three people out there that are willing to carry the mantle. And, and, and to support them in a, in a different way. So I think the, the rankings that you guys do is incredible, and there might be something interesting to layer on top of that where the rankings line up with sort of political, civic ambitions that create an opportunity to do something more mission oriented in a handful of cities and let's you know let's get a couple US cities to become the leading lights and in in my experience we do a lot of work with mayors when i'm the mayor of new orleans or louisville or provo and i see 10 other mayors are doing something amazing and they're getting positive feedback from their constituents from national media i'm on board like I find a way to that thing, and and the the sort of the 
um, that friendly competition in a way, but it's yeah. it's it's really productive if it's sort of well structured and channeled. And I think we should be, I think those are things that we should be thinking about. And competition's great. I, I wonder from the two of you if you want to jump in and talk about how do we get business leaders more engaged. Um, and if you have thoughts about politicians as well, feel free to jump in. But, but uh, you know, as many are having trouble in look, you know, recruiting talented workforces now, and how and people have this expectation they haven't really been, you know, adapting flexible arrangements for older populations. Do you think business leaders are starting to get it, or could if not, what can we do to encourage that? Do you want to start? Either way. Okay. Um, um, you know, it's interesting. I just met with a bunch of manufacturing business leaders, and uh, I was in Germany last week, and there was a big manufacturing conference, and happened to meet with a bunch of American business leaders. Interestingly enough, uh, U.S. manufacturing, despite all the, the rhetoric, um, is still pretty strong, and there's a demand for talent, <laughs> big demand for talent. <clears throat> and um, they were talking about, and, and they're losing people every single day because they're retiring, and they were talking about how Again, this was a technology discussion because mm -hmm. I'm a technologist, but they were talking about how we can use uh, technology so that they can get scale out of these 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 people later in their lives that were specialists in various areas, mm -hmm. and give access to um, all their plants using video conferencing system or whatever. The combination of connecting machinery so you can diagnose what's going on plus remoteness, they can solve a lot of scale. So. Um, they're trying to, it's not really a city issue, but it is an aging issue of trying to keep these um, very talented people who um, have you know, built American manufacturing uh, in, engage, because they have to. It's a competitive issue for them. Um, and this happened to be a paper mill company, and they have lots of disparate, I think 160 factories around the United States in lots of weird places. Uh, and, and so. They, they, all of them, uh, and there were 16 of them at the table with me, were just talking about this need for talent of maturing populations, and there's no backfill. People are not entering, young people are not entering into this workforce. And mm -hmm. so um, they're, they're highly motivated right now uh, to, yeah. to, to, to retain this talent. Yeah, we hear that from everyone, but especially from technology companies. I mean, not, not necessarily the, the computers, but technology companies of more traditional industrial companies, oil and uh, basic oil. materials, uh, things like those. It is a lot of that talent is aging and it's not filling up. I think the shortage is very, very clear. And I think the companies realize that on their own operations. They are very aware they need to find different arrangements to keep people for longer. They don't want to lose those folks. There's a lot of shortage of technicians on the field. The Franks and the Marys who actually know how to get stuff done and where the skeletons right. are hidden. So it really is a, a very urgent challenge, a very high priority for most companies. <laughs> However, there's another angle from the company side, which is on the innovation side, which is the, I, I'm based in San Francisco, so um, the innovation co community around there, I think there's a lot of young people on the new digital um, software industries. And there, I think there is a relatively large gap still on the appetite for doing apps that they know about and their friends play with in the millennial generation, as you were saying. We have paid a lot of attention to the young folks. But um, I think being able to get more of that new next wave digital technology solutions to the elderly and getting it in a way that actually is user friendly and applicable, I think it's a big deal. So but I if think I can, can I just oh, very quickly, yeah, yeah. I wanted to say something about, I was listening to you talking about the problem of aging not being at the top of the mind. Perhaps we who speak about aging have a branding problem. <laughs> Perhaps we, because it's always a problem and people are getting old, why don't we make it exciting about the next 40 and 50 right. years? I think we need to shift the, the debate because that's how I think everybody would rather mm -hmm. think about it, to make it exciting. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, as I think about too, it, it, because as many of the economic things that you, you know, my kids are out of college. I don't have yeah. to worry about that. I have, you know, new opportunities, and to think of it as this next chapter in um, our lives. But I, but I also want to follow up on what you were saying about uh, technological solutions. I know Tom, you and I have had these discussions too about how many of these things can um, help everyone, uh, no matter what their age. And there was an article a couple weeks weeks ago about a 14-year-old coder who developed a new app, uh, but because her grandmother had dementia, and she recognized that she needed some cues to figure out, uh, so they used artificial intelligence, face um, recognition, and 
you know, put in all her family members, and she could, when that person walked into the room, they could say, this is your, you know, granddaughter Susie, she's from XYZ. Uh, little uh, reminders like, you've called this person three times today, do you really mean to do this? You know, and I, and I think, wow, this would be really helpful for me, you know, like when I go around, and, not necessarily calling people three times, but the face recognition, you know, or any of those reminders of things that you have, and these solutions can really help all of us, I think, as we look at this population. I don't know if anyone wants to comment. Yeah, I mean, well, I'll just talk about, I mean, you know, the autonomous car thing is an interesting mm -hmm. one. Um, I happen to have uh, a 23-year-old that lives in LA and a 25-year-old daughter that lives in London. Uh, and then the extreme, I just got done talking about my, my mother. Uh, it's interesting, you know, rites of passage for me as a now 58-year-old male at 16 as an American was a car, right? Mm -hmm. My kids could care less. They could care less. My daughter doesn't have one. My son has one and begrudges it because um, he lives here. Um, and, and again, you go to the other extreme, elder part of your life, do you really want to drive? Maybe, maybe not. You just want to have transportation at access. So, you know, there are some common grounds that maybe we can, to build upon this point, between generational divides um, to, to pull these two yeah. things together. Uh, another area that I was involved in initially was in the dementia area, and there was a lot of research that was done historically about music, specifically mm -hmm. in, in dementia patients, uh, uh, people that had dementia. If you played music that was specific to you as a, and, and you had dementia at a specific point in time in your life, usually when you were young and in love, interestingly mm -hmm. enough, mm -hmm. um, it it brought you out of the sometimes a catonic state, and mm -hmm. so there were there's a lot of work that was done between young people and their grandparents interacting with music of their generation that meant nothing to the 16 year old child that was talking to their grandparents but these kinds of things you know have a way to to cross um, divides and I, and I think as any of these types of initiatives to me that's that's finding common ground across multi-generations will just accelerate this thing if they both need it <clears throat> the <clears throat> the folks at policy link which focuses on black equity issues uh, across the country call this the curb cut effect okay. and they talk about you know when when the ADA requires us to do curb cuts in all of our sidewalks what we're really doing is we're improving the quality of life for moms with strollers right. for people carrying sort of carts of bags back the sort of beneficial spillover effect is really strong and this might actually get back to that question of framing and branding and is there a way that some of the changes that we may envision you know for this sort of future city around aging populations actually have population-wide benefits mm -hmm. and we just need to be better about sort of zeroing in on those and articulating them I think that the issue of the you know the new and emerging technologies I think is a it's so promising and I, I I'm a little bit of a beaten um, beating the drum around city leadership and the thing that I would say is that you know we've tracked more than a hundred autonomous vehicle pilots in cities across the globe and in almost none of those instances were cities sort of at the table articulating a problem that is acute in their city that they would love that technology to help them solve in most cases the technologists are coming into the community and and they're selling in and they you know do you want to be a cool city let us do an AV pilot on your streets, and that's incredible for R and D develop, you know, R and D purposes for the company. It's not quite as immediately clear that the benefits um, are bestowed upon the citizens in these cities. And so, you know, I love what San Jose has done. So Sam Licardo, you know, just a stone's throw from Silicon Valley, has been approached by everyone to pilot autonomous vehicles on his streets, and he says yeah, I would love to partner with you, but I have vulnerable populations that are disconnected from economic opportunity. My streets are your streets if you want to test technologies that help me solve that gap. Mm -hmm. And it's a really positive and powerful way for the cities to shape markets and to articulate to the business community, these are the most acute things that we're feeling come back to us with technologies that are responsive, we will be uh, a market for you. And so, you know, just sort of playing that forward, imagine if a number of U.S. cities got together and said, you know, we've got these kinds of senior issues. Here's an advanced market commitment. You come back with technologies that help us square that circle 
and we're going to be really excited about that and become test beds for you. And I think that's a really powerful proposition um, from civic leaders to the business community. And, and, and I the think business untapped. community would love that because, again, it, that one of the challenges of business person dealing with with these cities is it is so fragmented. Right. So if the if the mayors would get together, it creates scale, which is what every technology company is looking for. Right. right? We we love scale. <laughs> we like broad broad scale. So. There, there's tremendous power in that, actually, economic power to, to, to get solutions deployed quicker. So I want to make sure I leave some time for Q&A from the audience, because the great thing about the Milken Institute Global Conference is those of you in the audience probably know just as much as those of us on the stage or want to engage in this conversation. So if anyone has a question, we have a mic in the back and uh, just want to raise something. Right. Okay. Um, just a question. Uh, Thank you very much. Question related to the comment that was made a while back about the financial assets available to the uh, aging population. I remember, uh, I think, a Senate hearing not that long ago that highlighted the average baby boomer has got $35,000, which actually seems like a lot of money, and an yeah. 80 million you know, strong population. How do we deal with this? I mean, I know we have to be sensitive to a lot of other concerns, but we got a very basic issue. Of, of an impoverished population, and that's in the United States. Mm -hmm. I think that is a very important question. And I think it is a question, it's not just in the US. I think the same challenge is in China, where their population is aging very quickly and they have fewer children to support. I think this is a reason, one of the reasons why the younger generation is actually having a hard time, because they know they worry about their parents. They know their parents don't have the income to have the kind of a life that they would like the, their parents to have. I frankly, I would love to hear some of the folks who have, who, have, who have talked about the financial side more and who have the solutions. I think it is one thing that I personally worry a lot. I do not want us to see a lot of poor people, uh, poor old people who, uh, who don't get the care that they deserve. But, you know, I'll just raise that as we think about in cities in particular, as older people often have home equity, uh, younger people can't afford to live in these cities. Are there opportunities for some of this, you know, co-housing or ways to think about generations sort of uh, solving problems together that they can find solutions? Yeah, I mean, I think there absolutely are, and that's where I think cities can pilot that and do it more nimbly, uh, and getting folks interested in doing that uh, is something that um, that organizations like the Conference of Mayors, mm -hmm. the National League of Cities, and others that, that work with these mayors and council members, I think, have a good network to activate. Mm -hmm. LA, it, um, I'm sorry, um, LA is, it's a different issue. It's the homelessness issue, but to your point about sort of piloting interesting new sort of um, housing models, they, they're piloting a sort of incentive package that basically if if you agree to build a grandmother's unit in your backyard of your single family residence and it meets certain specifications, the city will waive all of the permitting and regulatory fees that you would otherwise incur. It's something like ten to twelve thousand dollars that you would pay for the privilege of building in your own backyard. Um, and they will waive that and the trade-off is you house a homeless family for two to three years. The city will come in, subsidize the rent, provide a tremendous amount of social services around that homeless individual or family. And at the end of that period, you get your, your apartment back and that increases your equity. And so, you know, that's a great example of the creative sort of ideas that can bubble up from cities and, and that could potentially solve some of, or help us address some of and, these affordability issues. And I'll issues. just add another one that made me think of, of uh, a couple of projects around the country. I know there's one in Washington, D.C., similar to what you said about grandchildren, grandparents raising grandchildren, but looking at older adults as an asset, not necessarily a burden. And there, there's a housing community there where they've taken uh, foster families and paired them with older adults mm -hmm. And living in, the, they give the the uh, the older folks subsidized housing as return, but they also help the kids with their homework when they come home because they're not at work all day while while their parents are. They give them, you know, a snack or you know, uh, a, you know, just an opportunity to chat, which is mutually beneficial to both generations, and then helps this city problem. So, um, I know you had a question. You went yeah. Hi, my name is Quinn. Um, I'm a business school student, um, and I had a question about for um, 
because cities and, and states um, all have limited resources, both in terms of capital and human resources, and different elderly population require different types of solutions. So those who are, you know, age 50 to 65 versus someone who's over the age of 80. So how do, like, what what are some um, good examples or or um, tools that cities can utilize to th to think through prioritization and in terms of designing solutions that can address different uh, subsectors of the aging population. No, go ahead. I, you know, I, I think I, I think I think the first step in that process is to develop a full understanding of those different. Um, stratifications within the population. So I think the the uh, the sort of presenting challenge is let's stop saying all old people are like all other old people and recognize that as this population increases, both in terms of its size and in terms of the number of years that they are going to be active in cities, we need to be more differentiated in our language. And then I think, you know, this is what local leaders have to do all of the time. They. They have to prioritize scarce resources and where are the greatest um, trade-offs going to be in terms of public investments. And so I, I think there's not a cookie cutter response to that. I think it's about good data, a good understanding of what the challenges are and the diversity of populations and then bringing people together at the community level to say, hey, this is, this is our priority and that means we're not going to be choosing this and that's painful, but, but this is where the bigger benefit is for the greatest number of people. I think that's what mayors are very good at. I think what, what we want to layer on top of that is a more rich understanding of the diversity of need and that, that is growing and existing in communities. Yeah, I mean, also I'll just give you a quick practical example of how you know, at least I would start thinking about it in terms of segmenting the, the different populations within seniors, right? So in San Antonio, we used to have about 82 different senior centers where essentially some of them were standalone, some of them were in you know, church activity hall or public activity hall. They would serve congregate meals and offer information about services. And you think about um, the difference between offering services in a place where people have to get to versus services that are taken directly to somebody's home, right? Like a Meals on Wheels model, right? So when you start thinking about where you want to put your resources, I think policy-wise it's those kinds of things that I would be mindful of as we segment the abilities of people who are 60 to 75 versus people that are, you know, 76 to 90 or something. Just as a beginning sketch out of how I would start to think about all that. Great, any other questions from the audience? So, uh, well, this has been really engaging. I'm gonna give each of you an opportunity to uh, give us a closing comment. As we think about this, and as we've been talking about all these challenges, there's so many ways this could go in terms of you know some of the technology that we can give people to have healthy aging um, to the political leaders that we can recognize and bring to this, to, to the economic opportunities, but also the stress that it puts on cities. But if there are, you know, one thing you could say we should focus on uh, as we reimagine the cities, and if you could tell the leaders in the room as well as policymakers and business leaders, what would that one thing be? I'll start with you, Yana. Well, well I think for me it really is about making sure we make the most of the human resources. We have never seen a generation like the retiring baby boomers in the Western world today. They are so educated. They actually have quite a bit of income. They will have free time. I mean, that's just never seen in that scale in the history of the universe. That is our opportunity to make a big difference. Let's make sure that we have empower these folks to actually make a difference in their communities, in their countries, even across the globe. And I think that, for me, is the big, big priority. There is lots of, lots of things for cities and companies to solve, but that for me, if we don't have eye, eye on that ball, we'll lose that opportunity. We want those people to be productive and make, leave an impact. Great. Uh, who wants to go next? Tom? Boy, I'd have to echo that comment. I, I, I just think that we, you know, our generation, which is pretty much my generation, which is going to be faced with this pretty quickly, um, are the ones that um, were huge benefactors of 
uh, especially in the States, right? Um, uh, Post-war uh, baby boomers. Uh, we got a lot of benefits. It's, it's time for us to give back. I think I think it's time for us to give back, and I think we have the time. I think we have the time and and the capability to do that. And um, so I, I think that's that's a great comment, and I'd have to agree with that. Great, Jim. Yeah. Or, uh, oh, oh and yeah, you know, well, I mean, my message would be, and I think we agree on this, which would be to leaders to make it a priority yeah. that nothing happens, no matter whether it's in the private company or city government or state government and so forth unless it is a priority of those leaders and the clear message right now is that, that it's not one of those top priorities yeah. so that means that that not as much effort goes into these issues and not as much imagination is summoned yeah, about the right. possibilities yeah so I agree with that and and uh, you know there's a I was reading the McKinsey report and it talks so much about the productivity drain in a sense that the growing senior population places on cities and so what if we just flip that on its head as a starting point for the discussion and think of it as a productivity opportunity and you know just how do we summon the level of um, political leadership local leadership I think cities can be the ultimate platform for how we sort of move this conversation forward and so for all of us that are focused on cities and this population, I think we gotta just up the support and increase the sort of way that we're working with cities around this really critical issue. Great, well this has been a very stimulating conversation. Um, please join me in thanking our panel for a great discussion.